my name is Kristen Miller Zone. I'm curator of collections and exhibitions at the Lauren Rogers Museum in Laurel, Mississippi. And I am pleased today to be joined by Ku Shadler, who is an artist in our collection. And we're doing a series of videos with artists whose work has recently entered the permanent collection of Lauren Rogers Museum of Art. Hello, Ku, welcome. Hi, thanks uh, for giving me a call. I'm so pleased to be here to talk to you. Well, thank you so much. Your work is so gorgeous, and I'm sorry that our viewers will not get to see it in person, but we've got some spectacular photographs of it, and you're going to walk us through how you create this beautiful work and some of your background, and, and then we'll look at the piece that's in our collection, too. I am. Sounds great. So you graduated from Tufts University with a BA in Art History, and then you went traveling around Europe and you ended up in Florence, Italy. What made you end up there? Well, I, um, I was sort of fully formed in terms of my preferences before I even arrived in Florence. Uh, I grew up in a household that had um, beautiful images on the wall, uh, images of Durr etchings and paintings and things like that. And then when I went to Tufts and I majored in art history, uh, the day I walked into that art history lecture, I was warned that art history was a very tedious requirement, but I walked in and I couldn't have been happier. And so I spent my four years at Tufts um, studying all sorts of art, modern art, and uh, Asian art, but I really loved the Renaissance. So by the time I arrived in Florence, I was already a convert to that period of art. And in, some, in many ways, Italy, it didn't influence me, it just affirmed what I was already so deeply in love with. And in fact, one of the funny things, I've become an a temper painter, but when I was studying art history, nobody talked about mediums back then. It was mostly art plus history, the history of the figures or the cultural time, or, and we never studied mediums. And then when I lived in Florence, I didn't pay attention to mediums either. So I really didn't learn about a tempera until many years after college and my art history major, and after living in Florence. I left Florence in 86, I believe, and I didn't learn about egg tempera till 1993, something like that, so. Wow. So we'll yeah. talk about that technique and what that means in a little bit, but if you're anything like I was as an art history student who was going to school in the States, when I had been looking at everything either in books or on the screen where everything is the same size, no matter what it is, if it's a miniature or an, a, you know, a building, it's all the same size on the screen. Going and seeing the works in person was kind of life-changing in terms of being able to see the texture and see the, the proportion of the, of the paintings in the room. And then seeing, um, just kind of being more enamored even with the subject matter being kind of struck with it in person, like you were visiting a real person instead of just an object on a screen. And it seems from looking at this piece, um, Walk and Joy Peony's face, that you were uh, influenced by the subject matter or the compositions in the Renaissance paintings that you saw in Florence and around Italy. This, this still life is set kind of in front of a sacred cloth like a Madonna and child would be seated in front of. Can you talk a little bit about how you've used that with your still lives and, and how the Renaissance has really kind of influenced your compositions and your work in general? Um, yeah, that was beautifully put the way you described the experience of seeing the art in person. Particularly when I was in college a long time ago, we didn't have a lot of good color reproductions of even of the paintings. We worked from black and white images sometimes. So it was really pink slides that were old, <laughs> old pink slides that had turned. <laughs> so to see it in person and the distinction between a fresco versus a painting or something that was in a church, so you were already in a gorgeous sacred environment. Now it was, it, it, it was just one of the highlights of my life to spend that time in Europe, in Italy, looking at so much artwork every day. So I certainly imbibed that language, the visual language of that time. And because I always aspired to that kind of painting, traditional painting, I actually, I wanted to go to art school after um, high school, but my parents discouraged me. They said, get a broader education. And so I did because um, when I looked into art school, nobody was teaching what I wanted to learn anyhow. I didn't want to learn contemporary painting. I wanted to learn traditional techniques. Um, and in, in many ways, it was a great suggestion for my parents because taking in 
the visual language of the Renaissance was as important as going to art school where I wouldn't have learned the techniques I wanted anyhow. So I spent so much time looking at Renaissance imagery, either in person or in books, that when it came time to start making my own artwork, I just borrowed the templates that I saw in all that traditional work. I don't try to create um, a consciously or an intentionally symbolic or meaningful image. I just try to compose a really beautiful image. And so I, I took all their language because I knew that's what they were able to do with that visual language. And I really loved the play between a distant landscape and then the flatness of that brocade, which is just a ton of fun to paint. It's a lot of why I paint it. It's just so much fun to paint those brocades. So you have the, the distance, the three-dimensional atmospheric distance, and then the contrast of this flat brocade, which is fun to paint. And then you get to turn all the forms in the vase and the flowers. So I'm playing with flat, flatness versus volume and landscape versus still life versus portrait of the little butterfly. And it's just a lot of mixing and mac matching of uh, different visual and um, conceptual ideas. A lot of Renaissance work, especially of Madonna and Childs or things with this kind of three-part composition are really large works. Yes. And your works tend to be smaller. This one is 10 inches tall. Can you talk <laughs> a little bit about your scale? Well, some of that is necessitated by my medium and the way I work in my medium. And we are going to talk about a tempera more. It's a slow medium for most painters because you build up in very thin individual layers of paint. So it's slow. And then I slow it down even more because I build up such a remarkable number of layers. All temper painters are layer painters, building up many, many dozens of layers, but I bring it to the nth degree. And so I slow it down even more. So it's partly just a function of how long it takes to make um, these many layered paintings. But it's not just that because I love, I've tried to work larger and I feel like I'm swimming. I love the feeling of being able to hold a painting in my hands, like reading a book. I love the intimacy of that size as well. So it's not just the time factor. Um, it's also that I'm most uh, at home. I'm in my comfort zone in very small, uh, minute worlds, not only the size of the painting, but how small of an insect can I paint? All these little, the small minutia of the world are very dear to me and I like to spend time with them. So it relates to that as well. Being things in miniature is fascinating. And then also being able to hold something. I love that idea of being able to hold the painting in your hand like a book or like, like a, an object that's particular to you as opposed to being on view for, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I love that intimacy and immediacy for sure. Right, right. So let's talk about tempera and what that is. You moved back to the East in the early 90s and you settled in a small Southern New Hampshire town mm -hmm. and you started to study classical oil painting um, and then you started to pursue egg tempera studies. Can you tell us about that? Sure, there's a little bit of a, a, a period in between when I returned from living in Florence, I actually moved to California. And I spent uh, maybe seven or eight years out in California in the Bay Area. And I wasn't pursuing my art. I wasn't, you know, I'd, I'd been an art history major. I still hadn't really studied any studio art at all. But I reached my early 30s and I realized, well, if I want to be a painter, I better start. And so I took a history of painting class at the College of Marin in California. I think I was 32 something like that, 33, 32. And I was fortunate enough to have a history of painting class with a man, a painter named Chester Arnold. He's a wonderful artist. And he taught the history of painting through different mediums. So we did fresco one week, we did encaustic another week, and then we did a tempera. And the week we did a tempera, it was just two, three hour classes. That's all the instruction I've had in a tempera. And one three hour class, we made gesso panels starting from scratch. And in the second three hour class, we painted. And I remember 
holding the little fine brush and fussing with it and Chester leaning over my shoulder and saying, you're gonna be a temper painter. And I didn't know what he meant, <laughs> but now I do because I teach. And when I see students with that same rapt uh, look and happiness and contentment, I know what that feels like. Right. Yeah, so that's, so when I moved back East, then I eventually did move back East shortly afterwards after taking that class. And I was lucky enough to find a, um, two oil painters, a married couple, Numael and Shirley Polito, and they were uh, very traditional painters. And they, um, I started taking oil painting lessons from them and we copied old master paintings. Um, that's how you really learn the language of traditional painting is to actually copy paintings. It's like speaking a language. So I spent several years going back and forth between uh, working on egg temper on my own because I clearly loved the medium and I, I needed to figure it out. And then studying with Numael and Shirley um, once a week or twice a week for a few hours. And I spent about three years going back and forth between oil painting and egg tempera before I decided I was an egg tempera painter. So can you tell us what egg tempera is? Can you explain that to our, our viewers, what that I means? Can. And I could give you a five day <laughs> in-depth workshop. <laughs> Once I get going on egg tempera, it's uh, hard to get me to stop. Um, I love uh, understanding the materials and methods of painters as part of the joy of being a painter for me. So what a temper is, is all paint, uh, whether it's to cover a house or a canvas, any kind of paint in the world, it's basically composed of three ingredients, a binder, pigment, which is the color, and then some kind of dilutant or solvent to thin it. So oil paint, you have oil and pigments and you use some kind of solvent. Um, watercolor, it's pigments and gum Arabic with water. So egg tempera, the binder is actually egg yolk and you combine it with pigments and the solvent is water. And people think it's sort of strange you paint with a yolk of eggs, but really all paint mediums are natural substances, whether it's linseed oil or gum arabic or wax and encaustic that just happen to produce uh, good paint films. So that's what the yolk of an egg does. There's an oil in an egg yolk. It's called egg oil and it cures or polymerizes, similar to how um, oil painting oils do, but it happens to be emulsified in a watery base naturally, because that's what uh, the base of an egg yolk is. It contains lecithin and that emulsifies this fatty egg oil um, into a water base. So one way to think about egg temper paint is it's a water-based oil paint, a natural emulsion. When you try to pick up an egg that they've dropped on the floor, know how yeah. oily, <laughs> oily yeah. and viscous it is. Just leave that egg on your plate overnight and you know how hard it can be to scratch off the next day. Right. Yeah, and you, you have to make it fresh from scratch. You can't put it in a tube for the obvious reason that egg yolk gets pretty nasty after a day of being under. It's rotting. Yeah, so you make it from scratch every time. Wow. Yeah, it's great. So you kind of have to figure out how much of it you're going to need for that particular painting session so you're not wasting a lot. You always have some waste because you always have to be able to draw from a pile of paint. But you do have to learn that. You have to learn all sorts of things. Um, and it can be daunting to the beginner because unlike most mediums where you go to the art store and you buy your tube and you squeeze it out and you start working away, Temper's got this preliminary stage where you have to learn how to, it's called tempering properly, how to get the correct ratio of pigment um, to egg yolk, and then how to build up the paint, how to make the proper amount. You can't let it dry out while you're working with it on the palette. It starts to, um, it's no good anymore once it dries out. So there's a steep learning curve that's initially um, discouraging to people. But the fact is, once you get used to it, I actually, I work pretty quickly setting up. I'm ready to paint in anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. And then cleanup at the end of the day is super easy. There's no solvents involved. It's all water-based. So once you figure it out, it, it doesn't take longer necessarily than the other mediums to prepare or make. 
Um, but it's intimidating initially because of this learning curve of buying pigments and making paint from scratch and all that. And now that oil painters just get to squeeze it out of a tube instead of having to mix their own. <laughs> no idea what they're missing. <laughs> so the other, the other kind of older method that you use in your work is metal point. Correct. And so can you tell us about that medium and what that involves? Sure. When I was studying with Shirley and Numile Polito and playing with egg tempera, at one point Shirley said to me, you should try metal point if you like egg tempera. And I said, what's metal point? <laughs> and it's very simply, um, you know how we say pencils uh, that we use nowadays have their lead pencils. There's not really lead, it's graphite in pencils nowadays. But that phrasing comes from the time when lead really was. A stick of lead is what people actually drew with. Graphite is a relatively new, as in the 1600s, um, 1700s, drawing medium. Prior to that, going back to the ancients, what they had to draw with was either ink or chalk. And those didn't give you very precise or fine work. So if you wanted to do precise fine work, you worked with a nib of metal placed into a stylus. And if you draw a nib of metal over a surface that has a, a certain amount of hardness and tooth and abrasion, it will abrade a percentage of metal from the nib and deposit it onto the surface into the interstices of the whatever surface you're working on. Just like a drawing, a graphite drawing deposits a line of graphite, you can deposit a line of silver or gold or any metal sufficiently soft into the drawing surface and it will create a line. Um, it, it takes a little bit of finesse. It's not as readily erasable as graphite. It's, there's a mythology that it's not erasable at all, which metal point artists like to encourage that mythology because it makes us seem like superhuman with our drawing skills, <laughs> but you can't erase, but it is much harder than with graphite. You have to be fairly clear in what you're trying to achieve. Um, so, and you have to learn how to prepare the ground because the ground has to be receptive. And I recently developed a workshop on Metal Point a few years ago, and there are lots of grounds and options. It's another very exciting area if you're a materials and working methods nerd like me. <laughs> we love nerds of all sorts because yeah, we wouldn't have anything good without nerds. Heart nerds are great. <laughs> and then, so there's, can you explain what tempera graza is and why you're so excited about using it? Well, this is another one of these older mediums, although while metal point and egg tempera have very long, illustrious histories dating back to the ancients, tempera graza probably existed for a very short window between the end of egg tempera as the primary painting medium of Europe, which happened around 14 to 1450, and the rise of oil painting as the primary painting medium, which happened starting in 1400. And by 1500, oil was pretty much everywhere. And egg temper had more or less disappeared, except for the icon painters continued with it to this day. But there was this period, this very interesting period between 14 to 1500, where they were playing with egg tempera in parts of the painting or as an underpainting with oil on top or oil in other parts of the painting. Oil's more saturated, so they'd paint the blacks with oil. Egg tempera doesn't yellow, so they'd paint the whites in egg tempera. So they were playing with combining these two mediums and at times literally combining the two mediums, combining egg yolk and a drying oil, just as you would make mayonnaise, exact same thing. You get some oil, it has to be a drying oil like linseed and then you carefully, gradually blend in drops of egg yolk and you get something that looks like you want to eat it, <laughs> but you if should. You like mayonnaise. <laughs> it's like holiday sauce, it's beautiful, but you can paint with it. And um, so there is some evidence that this medium existed in the 1400s, you know, but it's not well proven that it existed. It's, if it did, it existed very minimally. Um, wasn't widely used. It was either egg tempera or oil for the most part. But a lot of people have sort of a wistful romanticism about tempera grassa because they love the linearity and the fast drying time that allows so much layering in egg tempera. 
but you don't get to blend or get this kind of atmospheric sfumato blending that oil allows. Okay. So people kind of want the best of both worlds. If right. I do tempera grasso, will I get all the best attributes of egg tempera and all the best attributes of oil and neither of the drawbacks? And it doesn't quite work that way. It's its own medium with like all mediums, wonderful qualities and limitations and frustrations. Um, but it does make, uh, you know, an egg tempera slightly more painterly. I feel like the um, flowers in this image are a little more painterly than I'm able to get in egg tempera, which is such a linear medium. So it's fun to play with the blacks nicely saturated because of the oil content. And, and I just like to play with mediums. So in egg tempera, it's, it's not, the, the surface you don't really see brush strokes like you do in oil painting. Is that, is that true or not as many yeah. as you can see in oil painting? You don't see um, the three-dimensional brushstroke in egg tempera because it's such a thin paint. You don't get what's called impasto paint, right. which is a paint that has any kind of density or three-dimensionality. So you don't see the brushstroke in that sense, but you do very much so see the nature of a line in egg tempera because unlike oil where you can lay down paint and then go back and feather the edges and smooth it out and make the evidence of the mark disappear, in egg tempera, you're left with it at whatever mark you apply it with. If you use a sponge, if you use a brush, you will get a brush stroke, you'll get a sponge mark because you can't go back and fuss with the edges. Okay. It's almost like building up a drawing, a line drawing. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't see a lot of lines in my egg tempera. Remember I talked about how long it takes me <laughs> to build up all those layers? And the reason I can paint in egg tempera and not get a lot of lines is because I work with such a thin paint that it leaves just such a whisper of a mark. You don't see the contour of the mark very much. Okay. But because it is so thin, I need to build up a lot, a lot, a lot of those marks to add up to enough of a value or color to read as I want it to read, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. It does. So egg temper paintings are often more commonly linear, like um, a hatch drawing. And how I work with it is a little less typical. So let's look at some of your pieces that mix media, um, your mixed media drawings. This is a beautiful example. And we see all of the, of the media, the mediums down below there. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing here? What am I doing? It's a good question. <laughs> um, while I'm playing with metal point and combining it with our other mediums, um, Metal point, it sounds exciting to, to say you, you draw with a gold point or a platinum point or a silver point. But in fact, uh, most times there's not a lot of distinction in the color of the various metal marks. It's very subtle. There's a slight warmth to a gold point or a copper point. Um, but if you paint on a dark ground, the color of a metal shows up a little more. So what I did in this, so I'm always trying to push the possibilities of these mediums. So what I did is I developed a dark surface um, that would show the metal point mark color more truly. This is photographed in a strong light. So you see the color more strongly than it actually is in person. It's a little more muted in person, but I just wanted to see how many colors I could pull from the metal point nibs. There's a very well-known metal point artist, Susan Schwab, and she does this with her drawing. She's always pulling out. She was in the show um, that we're going to talk about at one point, some point. And she loves to pull out all the colors of metal nibs. So I was trying to do the same thing. She uses it for abstract imagery. I was thinking, can I use it to represent something, representational imagery, to get the yellow of the Oriole? And I was able to, as you see, if I built up enough layers, the trick is to make your metal point ground have enough abrasion that you can pull off, abrade enough of the whatever metal you're working with to build up enough of that metal to have it really read as a color. Slow. It can be really, um, they can be almost ethereal if, yes. if there's not a lot of material from, from the nib that makes it onto the paper. It's very, it can be very faint. Yeah, so I had to work on how do I make a ground with more abrasion? So for example, silica is a very hard substance. If I put a little silica into my ground formulation, that increases the abrasion. That's the kind of thing I like to play with researching hard substances, how to durably mix them into a ground so the ground holds up over time. And then how much can I then 
get out of my metal point tools that way. And it's a lot of fun. Here's another example mm -hmm. of a mixed media drawing. Yeah, so the lettering is metal point and the base that the rabbit's sitting on is metal point, but the rabbit is entirely a tempera. And I love the freedom. It's, it's one of the reasons I enjoy um, studying materials in depth and understanding them, because if you understand them, you can play with them in a responsible way in the sense of making an image that hopefully will last. And so once I figured out, I mean, I've been working in egg temper for a long time. I understand it pretty deeply. And now that I've focused more on metal point, I'm realizing, oh, why not just combine the two? There's no reason not to. So he's a fully egg temper rabbit and um, with a metal point background. And it was a lot of fun to do. And that black in the background is a black gesso. Okay. So it's not painted on there, it's a black gesso. And he's painted on top of the black gesso. He really pops into three dimensions, not only because it's it being a different medium, but also the, the contrast of the black versus the white. Yeah. With the beautiful thing pink I gradations in his ears. Yeah, and that, that's what I love to play with flatness. This is an old trick. These are This is all the tricks you learn when you study traditional painting. A lot of people think of the old masters as fixated on realistic painting, but they weren't at all. They were playing with these things. So I'm sure anybody who knows traditional painting can picture these portraits where they have a beautifully rendered face, um, Three, very three-dimensional, and then they have this completely flat black head um, hat on top of their head with no light effect on the hat, which it should. If the face is illuminated by a light source and turning from light into shadow, the hat should too. But and go back and look at Raphael or uh, Memling or these many painters who would have these black hats that have no modeling. They're completely flat and they're playing with flatness versus volume. And I love that game of flatness versus volume. And so that's, you'll see that in my work a lot. And that's definitely what you're picking up on with that flat black background. Kind of a selective realism in order to achieve other goals. Yeah. Yeah. And to the, the goal is to the enhancement of each that if a painting is just fully, for me, um, entirely realistic, it's, I feel it's kind of deadening or it's, I mean, we live in the real world, but fully abstract work, which can be very exciting visually, I'm missing the world. So I like that combination of reality and abstraction intermi intermixed with each other, overlapping each other, because that's sort of who we are is this mix of those things too. So I like that, um, the two completely intermeshed, uh, abstraction and realism. Excellent. Let's go through your working process by looking at a finished work and then looking at some in-process slides. This is In the Heaven Diptych 2, gorgeously framed into a diptych or a two-pieced object. And so this first slide, what is your process going on here? Well, um, this is my strange working method that I've developed over many years. Um, because egg tempera is built up in so many layers that it's not that you can't improvise, you can, but if you improvise too often and everything has been built up in a hundred layers and then you've got to take those a hundred layers out and rebuild them, it's kind of good to go in with a, a clear game plan, a good roadmap of you're more likely to get there if you have a clear roadmap. You can see your values, you can see your colors, you know your shapes, you've understood the drawing. And initially, as did traditional painters, I did studies and drawings and worked it up, but it's already a slow medium. I have to make all my materials from scratch. We live in the modern age. It was like, how can I speed this up? And so what I did is I started making these collaged images where I would take a mixture of photographs that are my own. I take my own photographs. Um, for the most part, but the butterflies I might take off the web or I'll draw. The blue butterfly was taken off the web, but I had to alter them a little bit. The yellow butterfly, I pre, you know, I just drew. And I cut and paste and I draw on top and paint on top until I have what I want the painting to look like. And then I make a black and white copy of it 
to see my value pattern to see if I have a good range of values. If it's exciting in the value stage, you know, you've got half the battle won at that point. It should be exciting, just values, black and white, no color. So I'll do a copy in black and white, check it there. And then when I'm confident of my image, all I have to do is paint it. And by separating out the composition, the composing, designing part from the creating part, I can enjoy each of those stages more fully. Um, if you dive into a painting without a clear plan, I, I know many painters half the time they're like, what am I gonna do in that corner? <laughs> when they're, they're not thinking about the painting, they're just wondering about that darn corner where they don't understand the drawing or they haven't resolved the value. And, and, and sometimes they don't know when they're done. Yeah, and, <laughs> and some mediums, some people are good at that improvisation and some mediums are good at improvisation. I'm not in any way arguing against it, but not everybody's good at that. And certainly the old masters understood the benefit of these clearly thought out plans. They just didn't have the tools of copy machines and cutting and pasting. Um, and certain mediums aren't very amenable to improvisation. And egg tempera, as I say, it's possible, but you pay a little bit of a price. So I do these mock-ups where I figure out my, and I, I still will change things. You'll see differences. It's not that I'm tied to that, but it's a really good roadmap to get me going once I start mixing my paint on the palette and getting to work. So it's a little tricky when you do a diptych and that you do have to consider and you can see in this photo where the painting is getting cut in half. I work on a single panel when I do diptychs or triptychs or polyptychs. And because it's easier to not have to rotate two or three paintings on your easel and um, it's just easier to work that way all at once. But you do have to consider the gap where the frame's going to be. You can see how the curtain looks like it's jumping up and down like that. But that's because I had to plan ahead for the area the curtain will travel across on the frame in, you know, visually, so it's tricky. And people are, are appalled that I will paint um, a meticulous fussy egg temper painter and then take it to the table saw <laughs> to cut in half. But uh, it's fun. And um, I was trained as a woodworker when I was living out in California. I spent a few years as a woodworker, always loving craft and materials. So I, table saws are very well behaved machines and it actually is, um, works very well but precise yeah it works real well fabulous yeah, yeah. that's that makes me nervous but if you're comfortable with it <laughs> that's totally fine i'm good so far so good <laughs> and then here's the finished product so you as you as we saw from your preparatory drawing you always intended for this to be a diptych and so you you dealt with the curtain and, and where it went over why did you want this to be a diptych from the beginning a good question. Um, I, there's so many reasons. Uh, it's back to that idea of a book. I like a painting feeling like a book. I also like that if you own a diptych, you can hang it on the wall or you can prop it up on a bookcase at an angle and it will stand up on its own. So it becomes a, a little bit more of an artifact or more sculptural, which I like. I like objects. I'm not... Um, I'm a craftsman in many ways, as much as I am a painter. Um, I was a furniture maker for many years. Um, so I like that quality of diptychs. I like the separation of these subject matters. One is the quote, the other is more the still life landscape. Um, I like the hardware, <laughs> like the little latch, you know, and the hinges, the little mini hinges. Um, it's a lot of fun trying to plan a diptych, have them be two, separate paintings, successful on their own, and yet also two paintings that relate to each other. Success, it's a gorgeous piece. Thanks, it was a lot of fun. So this is a, another finished work that we're gonna go through the process for, Warblers and Wild Apples in, a, in blue glass bowl. So here's the finished piece. And tell us about this image. Yeah, so, this is a painting I literally shipped um, to my gallery, I don't know, a few days ago. And uh, you can see the mock-up on my table easel. That's that idea of I do this mock-up, the combination of cut and paste exactly, and um, drawing and painting on top to get my roadmap. And then uh, the painting itself is on the desk in front and I'm starting to build up the background. Um, to the right is my palette with my mixed 
tempered paint. That means pigment with egg yolk combined. Above the palette, you see these watercolor, these porcelain watercolor dishes, and they are just pure pigment paste. There's no egg added to those. And I've developed a lot of shortcuts. I had a student say, don't call them shortcuts, call them expediencies. It sounds better. <laughs> but the fact is, they're shortcuts. We all need shortcuts. Um, so I've developed a lot of ways to try to speed up this slow process. And one is that I keep my pigments in these wells of these watercolor dishes. And every morning, the first thing I do when I go in is I rehydrate them. And it's like a piece of dried earth. They just suck up the liquid and they turn back to paste. Instead of going into individual jars of pigment paste every day or dried pigments and hydrating them every day. And it's a small thing, but these little efficiencies can really move you along as a painter. So those are just pigments, the tempered paint on the palette. Um, you can see my little jar of egg yolk next to my dirty water dish. I don't know if you, there's an eyedropper in it. It's, yeah. I don't know. But, um, and then what you're seeing is a lot of sponges, uh, both on the palette, there's some makeup sponges. Yep in front of the egg yolk and on the table there's some next to the painting yep those are kitchen sponges and this is another one of my shortcuts is when I first build up a painting I sponge on a relatively thick paint for egg tempera it's about the consistency I would say of light to heavy cream which is nothing for oil let's say but for egg tempera that's a fairly thick paint here's the idea that if it takes you I'm making up a number but if it takes you 100 layers or 200 layers to develop an image with thin, thin paint, if you first block in a painting with a slightly thicker paint, you're sort of getting to layer 30 pretty quickly. And then on top of that blocked in thicker paint, I then go to the thin, thin, thin paint that egg tempera is more known for. And it's again, one of these efficiencies I've developed for my working method. So that's um, the painting at the block in stage where I've developed, um, I would say almost everything in there has been sponged on. Now the trick with the sponge, and this is where you have to be a little bit more of a craftsperson than a fine artist, so to speak, is if you're going to sponge on paint, you have to make masks because the sponge will go where you want it to go and where you don't want it to go. And this is where my mock-up drawing serves me because I can make copies of the drawing. And if you go back one, Kristen, you'll see um, in the lower left, see those black and white copies. I can cut out masks to be able to sponge on the various pieces of the painting using those copies. It's a very kind of crafty way to work. It doesn't suit all painters suits me really well. And I have a lot of students who like this because people who are attracted to tempera tend to be sort of craft oriented anyhow sometimes, either draftsmen or craft oriented or both. Right. So that's all done with sponges and it just gets me to this development of the paint faster. And uh, the way I put it, it takes me 20% of my working time to get the first 80% of the paint layers down. And then I spend the rest, the 80% of the time getting those last 20% of the layers. They take so long because they're so thin. They're so thin. Yeah. And does the kind of modeling that I'm seeing here, is that a function of the fact that it was putting, it was put on by sponges? So partly, it's not a solid surface? Yeah, it's partly, um, I can get pretty smooth with sponging. It takes practice. If anybody's a temper painter, listening to this and wants to give it a try. It, it takes practice to become a good sponger, um, to get a smooth surface and not leave a mark and all. The marks you're seeing on the birds um, is more that I'm starting to glaze over them very freely. I, I work very freely to start. I'm throwing on colors and things get quite messy in a way. So what I'm doing is I, at that point, I'd sponged on the birds, but I was bringing out more glazes on the background. And I just went over the birds, I didn't care because I had so many layers to go. Right. Whereas the little granite ledge that the bird on the right is standing on, that's done with a lot of splattering and sponging. Okay. And the tempera is very amenable to all faux finishing techniques. I use feathers and sponges and even faux finishing tools like combs and stencils. The background is a stencil. 
And all those, because tempera is such a fast drying paint, all those um, techniques that you would see in a faux finishing video or book work great in a tempera. So now you can see how I start to build with little brush strokes on top of that base coat. And that's how you start to get <clears throat> the precision, the gradual turning of form, the details. That's all done with brushwork. Which isn't to say I won't once in a while throw a mask back on and sponge on a glaze over the entire thing. I, you know, I continue to play a little bit with sponges and masking, but mostly I'm working with a brush at this point. And often a very fine brush, uh, a zero, a quintuple aught, a one. A two is, a two to four is a big brush for me. <laughs> <laughs> then back to the finished work. So. Tell us how the surface has changed since the last image that we saw. So another thing I do that's a little atypical, although perhaps not as much so these days, is I like to varnish my tempera paintings. And tempera, for reasons having to do with the quality of the paint, it's something called a high PVC paint. It's got a lot of pigment load in the paint and it makes a microscopically rough surface that scatters light. So an unvarnished egg tempera painting has a matte appearance and the colors aren't as saturated. Think of it like the difference between a wet rock and a dry rock. So a dry rock is an egg tempera painting without a varnish. And then if you varnish the egg tempera painting and you fill in that kind of rough surface with the varnish, it becomes saturated and smooth. Um, it doesn't have to be glossy. You can control the gloss with various varnish additives, but it will get this much more rich, saturated look. And I like that look. Um, it upsets temper painters. There are many temper painters. One of the things they love about egg tempera is this unique matte finish that's like a pastel drawing or um, and admittedly, you lose that with egg tempera varnished. There's always gains and losses and artists just have to choose what they want. A varnish also adds um, protection to the painting. So there's pros to it, there's cons to it. I could go into more, but I won't bore the audience with my uh, varnish. Varnishing is complicated, not like tempera. Suffice to say, if there are any tempera artists listening, understand it's a complicated process and you have to research it and understand it. So do you varnish all of your tempera paintings? I do, and I always have. And it's when I first started doing it 20 years ago, I got a lot of pushback. Um, so, and there are, there are drawbacks to varnishing. Um, there's benefits, and there's drawbacks. Just as if you don't varnish your egg tempers, there are going to be benefits and drawbacks. But I think it's becoming a little more um, understood and accepted. And I have some um, conservator friends some material friends, uh, George O'Hanlon at Natural Pigments has been a big supporter and help to me to figure out how to varnish as have some conservators. Um, so I do it and um, I, I'm really happy with it, I, but it, it's not for everybody. You can see what a beautiful jewel-like surface it has produced here. Well, I used to be a smarty pants and when I got um, flack from people, I'd say, well, if it was good enough for Van Eyck, it's good enough for me. <laughs> Van Eyck, you know, one of the greatest, you know, 15th century painters, um, he wasn't an a temper painter per se, but people have been varnishing for a very long time. And right. so it's always a personal choice. That's what art is about. You have to go where your inspiration takes you, where your muse has to go. It's all up to you. That's right. That's the joy of it all. <laughs> so here is, now this is a full composition, correct? Yeah, and before we move to the detail, I just want to say this is another one that was a lot of fun combining. It's, it's mostly an egg temper painting, but on the left-hand side, that black is actually casein paint, which is a milk-based paint. Black uh, casein, commercial casein, which has a percentage of oil in it, a company in particular called, I think it's Pel Pelican, I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyhow, it's a great surface for metal point. And I knew I wanted to write the quote in metal point, not in paint. I wanted it to be subtle, not strong. So it's mostly an egg temper painting. The black strip is casein, black commercial casein paint. And then the lettering is metal point. And I got that. That's what I wanted, that just quiet pushed back look of the quote. 
I'm working on a painting right now where I'm doing a similar thing. It's a lot of fun. So here's a close up. Yeah, and the reason I wanna show this close up is tempera is such a funny medium because the paint layers are so thin that if you were to actually measure the depth of those paint layers, it's probably a 32nd of an inch or a 16th, I don't know what. It's, it's absolutely minimal. But there are probably anywhere from, you know, 150 to 200 layers. And you kind of feel it. There's almost a hologram effect to an egg tempera painting when you uh, see it in person, but in a reproduction, you can't really get it. But looking up close, you get a little slightly better sense of it. And that's why I like to show these close up details of my work. So you can see, you get a little bit of the sense of the many, many, many layers that create that kind of hologram sense of depth in the image. Harkening back to 19th century and earlier trompe l'oeil, trompe l'oeil painters who, who were trying to fool your eye, the composition of this one, it feels like you've stumbled upon this composition and it's three dimensional. You could go down and grab, grab one of those pieces of fruit. Yeah, and it, it's again that playing with the flat black versus, um, and it's a strange, it's an aerial view. How does that kind of work? Why aren't they falling off the page? I, I like to play with all those. I want the image to be convincing enough that the person buys it, so to speak. They don't question it too much, but there's a little bit of a, um, you know, dissonance that, not dissonance, that's not the word I want, but just something a little unreal about it. I don't want too much realism. And also in this close-up, you can see um, the lines, those straight lines and the wood grain are done with a faux finishing comb and uh, the splattering, um, which is such fun to do. And so, yeah, a lot of different techniques in there to get that effect. I don't know if this is gonna be completely out of left field, but the splattering techniques and these tiny pinpoints of color mm -hmm. remind me of looking at a Vermeer Mm, interesting. No, that's good. That's, that's that good. you know, kind of adding that light and that life of that light in sprinkled little dots throughout what we think in Vermeer was caused by the effect of looking through a lens, but right. but it, it does give you this yeah. kind of sparkle. I don't mind you bringing up Vermeer, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I also I do. There is something about um, wanting to you know, tempera is such a linear and controlled medium. I actually, recently on my Instagram page, had someone said why are there little dots all over every page you're painting when I showed my details? And, um, but it is, I'm trying to get a little light and life into the painting because it can be such a controlled and linear literal medium that I like to, the Jackson Pollock-like effect, the, the feeling that there is just activity, there's color, there's bits of light in the painting, yep. So we're going to look now at some times when you use similar or the same composition in works of different medium uh, media. I'm going to say that again. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at a few works in which you use the same or similar compositions in your paintings and your mixed media drawings. Yeah, so this was a triptych. I really enjoyed this triptych. It was kind of challenging because it had such a big landscape and so many still life objects and, and but it was a lot of fun. And um, so then I actually, then you can switch to the drawing. I did a drawing based on the central panel and generally in art, you start by drawing and then you work up a painting from it. But I often do the reverse because my drawings are sufficiently complicated and mixed medium. And um, I like to play, like here I'm playing on a handmade paper from a, a well-known paper company called, called Twin Rocker. You can see that gorgeous deckled edge. Mm -hmm. So I didn't wanna, I'm not drawing to experiment or figure things out. I'm, I'm drawing to um, develop something complicated. So I like to, I'll start, I sometimes we'll go through my catalog of uh, mock-ups or old paintings and say, oh, that would be fun to do a drawing from that. And then I feel a freedom to kind of experiment and play in the drawing because the composition is all settled for me. So, and that, that was entirely a uh, metal point um, with just a little bit of color added to the ground. And um, yeah, that was a lot of fun to do. The deckled edge of this one kind of reminds me of fresco fragments. 
Yeah, you know, the cool. edges of the fragment that have fallen off the wall and you get that kind of very irregular contour or outline to the piece. Well, and when I framed it, I wasn't sure how to frame it. So what I did is I gilded a panel and then I floated it above the gilded background. And so in the frame, you see, you know, this deckled gilded background around the edge of the painting. It's nice. And same thing with this, um, the same idea. I did a drawing from this. I, I had fun with that painting. And I thought that would be a good metal point drawing. So then I worked it up in metal point. And this is another one where I was playing. Um, one of the unique things I do in my egg temper drawing is I, it's complicated, but I'll build up an image till it's quite developed. And then I apply what's called a scumble. And a scumble is a very thin, transparent layer of white paint over the whole thing. If you look at on a misty day and you see how the landscape looks in the diff distance, that's, that's what a scumble, a light scumble will do in a painting. And why would you do that to a painting? Well, after you build it up, it, it, for a lot of reasons, it injects atmosphere, it controls values, it's a good base to start to build up color again. There's lots of reasons. But what I'm getting to is I started to do that with my metal point drawings is I, and this is a drawing that I really pushed that possibility with. I, built up a colored ground for the metal point. I drew the metal point and then I put a new fresh layer of this ground, this gesso over the whole image. <laughs> I couldn't believe I did it, but I knew I wasn't quite getting the atmosphere I wanted. And again, this layer is very transparent. Think of a layer of um, glassine or something or, or cellophane just with a little bit of, um, you know, white to it. And so you can see it. It's a ghostly image. And then I started building it up again. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to do another <laughs> scumble. And I probably scumbled over this image, um, I don't know, eight or 10 times each time building it up. But it was a, because of that, I felt like I was able to get atmosphere from a medium that is not always very atmospheric per se. It's more linear. Um, so I had a lot of fun with that. And then I did add, a, I did use a little bit of um, a temper paint to bring out the pink in the cheeks and a little bit of color in areas. Her skin is glowing beautifully. And we admired this piece so much at the Lauren Rogers Museum that we acquired it. We first saw it in an exhibition that we had in 2018 called Silver Lining, Contemporary Works in Silver Point. We at the Lauren Rogers Museum tried to do exhibitions that, uh, kind of speak somehow to our permanent collection while at the same time showing as many contemporary artists as we can. And this was our 95th anniversary year and we were celebrating our excellent collection of Georgian era silver. And so um, we were going with the silver theme and so we decided to do a metal point show. This was co-curated with Hannah Israel, who's the gallery director at Columbus State University. And we were introduced or reintroduced to some fabulous artists for the show. And that is one of the advantages of doing an exhibition of contemporary works. You can collect them from the artists and they can, um, they can become part of, of the collection that we sh can show forevermore. So we're so excited to have that piece as part of our collection. Well, thank you. It's a um, total thrill when a museum wants to have a piece, and not only as an affirmation of the work that we do, you know, the work, it's such a privilege to be a painter, but it is a very solitary um, activity and, uh, you know, it's challenging to make it work. Um, so that affirmation from museums is so wonderful, so encouraging. And then the pleasure of sharing work, knowing that it's not just going to go, I'm grateful for collectors, of course, but it's wonderful knowing that it's not going to be hidden away somewhere, but it's actually shared, particularly when it is something where you're trying to push, you know, the boundaries of a medium and trying to show other painters and people who've never heard of egg temper, who've never heard of metal point, or even if they have heard of egg temper, they think it's all icon painters or Andrew Wyeth both of which I love, but it's not the only reality for a tempera. Right. Or if they think metal point, they think of it as just a gray drawing um, and it can have so many other permutations. So being able to share that via museum is priceless, knowing how museums care for work. Um, so very honored and thrilled. I um, knew almost all the participants in the show. I love them, they're wonderful artists. We're a great community of people. So it was in every way, a wonderful opportunity and I was very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. 
the work that I showed is by AJ Smith, and we do have a video uh, conversation with him too. So look to our YouTube. Yeah, that was great. I love that. He's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, and his wife, Mark, they're just all wonderful artists, yeah. He's a wonderful artist too, right, right. So I'd like to end on this piece, which is one of your most recent pieces. Yeah, yeah. So this is that theme I've been working on um, where I have these slightly aerial views, uh, which is a little unusual. You know, artists always like to try to push things and challenge themselves. So I've been taking these aerial uh, photographs we had the most remarkable apple year last year that I've ever seen in my entire life. We had, we have a lot of apple trees on our property and we had, um, and we probably had 300 apple trees on our property, little guys, big guys, and uh, they, they were dripping. So I, and I, just with apples. So I took tons of photographs of these gorgeous wild apples with all their blemishes and tree, uh, the leaves attached to the stem and and I've been working on that ever since. And um, I really, that blue, I don't have that color in my palette. So I had to push myself. I had to go buy a new modern pigment that I don't usually work with. I, I had a guess which modern color would nail that blue and it, it worked. So I was thrilled to get that blue. And then the writing is actually painted on. Now I'm, I'm playing with doing the writing with um, Metal Point. But uh, that one was actually painted with um, gold pigment on there. Uh, and one of the, I often frame works this way. It's called floating a painting. And you mount, because I work on panels, you can mount the panel to a gold leaf board. And then you uh, let that little bit of the gold background show. It's like a little moat between the painting and the frame. And um, it sets off the painting nicely. I like working with gold. So um, that's how that piece is framed. And I have quite a few pieces that I frame that way. Would you mind telling us about the title of these, this piece? I've noticed this <laughs> phrase in a few of your works. Yeah, um, uh, I, no, I'm happy to describe it. I love quotes. Anybody who knows me, I, I, when I teach, I'm always giving students quotes. Um, I make bookmarks for people all the time with quotes. I'm just a quote person. I like wisdom. I like words. I like that words have meaning. I also like that words are very visual. I like that they're architectural. I like the structure, the lines, the circles. So just visually, even if they didn't have meaning, but the fact that they have this wonderful visual quality and they convey meaning, I can't tell you how that never ceases to astound me. <laughs> that they not only can mean words, but you put the words together and you can come up with a phrase that contain wisdom. It's, it's just a remarkable thing to me. So I like to include quotes for their meaning and because they're of the joy of the lettering, the architectural quality of them. But I don't wanna be didactic in my painting. I'm not trying to uh, give a message. And I just want people to enjoy something well composed and lovely to look at. So I usually try to knock back my lettering or hide it a little bit, make it a little less distinct. This one is really clear. Uh, it's a quote, it means, um, it's called Amanasiri, and it means love to be unknown. And um, I can't explain why these, I mean, I can't explain why these quotes appeal to me, but it's kind of spontaneous. I'll read a quote and it will resonate. And this resonated with me because of the contradiction as a painter that you have to promote yourself to be successful. And yet painters often are, especially traditional painters, especially me, I'm a very solitary, quiet person. I want to be left alone to paint. So there's this real strange dynamic between promoting yourself or your work, I should say, and wanting to just be left alone to do your work. And then when you combine it with the age of social media, um, it gets even more complicated. I just recently got an Instagram page. I, I still, I don't have a cell phone. I don't have, I've never been on Facebook. So I'm very torn um, by this whole dilemma. Um, and there are those humble little apples. They were a dime a dozen in our field last year. And yet each one was so perfect and beautiful. They are so content to be perfect and unknown. So all those meanings are, um, are built into that. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Ku. I'm glad that you're letting us know them and I'm glad that you're letting us know you a little better today. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. 
Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much to you and the museum and to anybody who's watching. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us.